Jacks In Conversation, the series where I have the lucky job of interviewing uh, individuals that are leaders in our field, and I get to bring them to you. Today, um, I get to interview Professor uh, Kelly Chivale of the University of Cape Town, South Africa. He's the South African Research Chair in Drug Discovery. He's also the director of the South African Medical Research Council, founder and director of the University of Cape Town Drug Discovery Center. He also has been appointed as a member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Grand Challenges um, uh, Committee, in particular as it focuses on challenges in Africa. He's a member of the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. He's on the advisory board of the United Kingdom Department of Health Antimicrobial Innovation Research Fund. And I could go on, but of course I wanna leave time so that uh, we can get to know Kelly um, uh, better. Let me just add that his group spans two campuses, um, reflecting how he has um, and is employing his tools as a synthetic chemist in the discovery of uh, novel drugs, in particular focused in the areas of malaria um, and tuberculosis. So one part of his group resides in the Department of Chemistry, the so-called upper campus, um, while the other part of the group um, is in the medical school campus of the University of Cape Town. Welcome, Kelly. So if you don't mind, let me begin by asking you some questions about um, when you were young um, and growing up in Zambia. What can you share with us about that time during your formative years? Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, it's good to be with you. Um, yeah, th thanks for the very kind introduction. Yeah, you know, growing up in Zambia, where I come from, we call them um, uh, townships uh, or villages and stuff like that. Uh, and that's basically how I grew up. I basically lived in a village and, 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 and townships uh, with no access to um, uh, electricity, no access to running water. And of course, you, you had to walk to school, um, you know, bare feet. You know, my, my mother was actually a widow because my father died when I was only two months old. Uh, and so growing up, uh, being raised by my mother, uh, and of course, uh, going through all the challenges of being raised by a single parent. Uh, I mean, I did that. Um, and of course, fortunately for me, for people like me in Zambia at that time, uh, especially after Zambia gained independence from, uh, from, from the British, uh, the then government of uh, you know, the president, uh, Kenneth Kaunda, who his government uh, basically introduced uh, free education, which allowed people like me from very poor backgrounds to have access to good quality education. Do you recall the moment when you said, I'm going to do science and I'm going to do chemistry in particular? Actually, Eric, you know, so when you're growing up uh, under those conditions uh, in, the, in the townships, right? So there's, there's actually no exposure to, to science. You, you don't read books. You're actually just surviving uh, you know, every day, you know, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so that exposure wasn't there. However, when I eventually got to high school, you know, we used to call it uh, secondary school. And I think this is a tremendous example of the importance of having good teachers. And it was actually, when I went to high school, we were taught by you know, expatriates from, from different countries because the government at the time, because of the critical shortage of uh, uh, people in the teaching profession, had to rely on um, overseas uh, teachers. So there was one teacher from, uh, from India, uh, Mr. Rachman, who was teaching us chemistry. And for me, coming from the townships, that was my first exposure to, to chemistry and just the fascination with, um, you know, chemistry practicals, you know, even just doing a simple titration where you see, you know, color changes. So that to me was just like a miracle. So that was the beginning, I guess, of the fascination with, with chemistry. But really, it's when I got to the University of Zambia as an undergraduate, that I really, really, really just fell in love with organic chemistry. Yeah, you know when it's the right feeling, right? When it's the right connection. Uh, you knew it was gonna be organic chemistry right from the beginning? Yeah, so initially, Eric, when you get to undergraduate in those days, so, so you would do chemistry broadly, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry. But as I went forward in my undergraduate uh, program, 
um, organic chemistry, the logic of it, um, I think for me was just fascinating that you could look at a chemical structure, you could recognize functionality, and you could actually envisage uh, making modification to that functionality and bring about uh, different properties, whether those are physical, biological, was really the, the fascination of the logic of organic chemistry. So when did you become interested in synthesis in particular? Well, actually, so before I went to study at Cambridge in England, um, and I remember, you know, after I knew that I had been shortlisted for an interview for a Cambridge Livingston Trust Scholarship. So I took this handbook of faculty members uh, at Cambridge. In those days, there used to be hard copies. Everything was hard copies, not electronic. And as I went through each faculty member, you know, there were a number of, uh, you know, top organic chemists at Cambridge. And what really drew me to Stuart Warren was actually the way he pushed the curly arrows, just the way that he explained the work that he did. And again, like I said earlier, the fascination with recognize, recognizing a chemical structure, recognizing that you change functionality and that can change or introduce new properties uh, was already something that began to interest me uh, from the perspective of doing synthetic chemistry. The ability to modify a chemical structure and bring about different uh, properties, but also thinking about the tactics and strategies for constructing a molecule. So at a, at a very early age, you got on a plane and traveled quite um, a distance. I'm curious what it was like arriving in the United Kingdom, I guess alone, right? With uh, probably a bag or two and knowing that this was going to be the place you called home for the next uh, four years or so as you work towards a PhD. Absolutely, Eric. So I was not prepared for what I discovered just the moment I landed in, in the UK and traveled to Cambridge. So basically I would describe it as follows. Um, first of all, it was a culture shock. The weather was strange. The food <laughs> was strange. The people were strange. And the science was strange. Everything was strange. But that was, of course, a new chapter. And of course, I knew the reason I was in England. Uh, and of course, that was the focus that I kept in spite of those things that were really strange to me. Well, and strange probably also drove your curiosity, right? To, to, to adapt, to learn new things. And in this particular case, to um, adapt yourself to the rich scientific environment that is the University of Cambridge. Absolutely, Eric. I, of course, knew that I was really blessed and privileged uh, to gain acceptance to, to Cambridge. Uh, and so I think that approaching life from that perspective of gratitude, recognizing that I was coming to a top institution, uh, really gave me the focus and that any sacrifice that had to be made was worth it. The opportunity and the infrastructure and knowing that I could really, 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 really Again, the kind of expertise that I could only dream about in Zambia was a source of inspiration and motivation. So what did you work on with Stuart, with Stuart Warren? So my project with Stuart Warren was um, on asymmetric synthesis, it was actually asymmetric outer reactions. In fact, I remember <laughs> this is probably the first time I came across Eric Carrera. I think this is you know, trying to follow some of the recipes that I think, uh, you know, the work that came from the David, David Evans group uh, on making, you know, Cairo Xerilis. So it was basically synthetic methodology, uh, doing asymmetric synthesis, part of it, uh, you know, using, you know, Cairo Xerilis, and of course, starting with the pro Cairo group, and of course, uh, using Xerilis to bias uh, in anti-selective reactions. Uh, so that's pretty much was the focus of my PhD, was uh, developing synthetic methods um, um, within um, asymmetric synthesis. So from there, you went on to Liverpool. What did you do in Liverpool? So I was with Nick Greaves, and, and the project there was also asymmetric synthesis, but this time it was using organolanthanide reagents. So basically, modify lanthanide sorts um, 
by attaching, um, um, let's say, chiral dial, cytosymmetric dial, like a binapfel or the tadels by beta zebra. Uh, and of course, then forming reagents from green yards or organometallic reagents and in doing an anti-oscillative addition to aldehydes. So it was still synthetic methodology, asymmetric synthesis, but this time using organometallic, chem chiral organometallic reagents to mediate uh, in anti-selective reactions. So what compelled you from there to go to Southern California? I mean, I can think of lots of reasons, but uh, to go to Southern, sunny, warm, dry Southern California, in particular Scripps, uh, to work with Professor Nicolau. So Erica, at the time, you know, this is exactly, you know, when I talk to young people is, you really have to keep an open mind because when I moved from Zambia to Cambridge, all I knew that there was only a PhD. But until I got to Cambridge, then I realized that actually there's more that you've got to do a postdoc. So then I discovered that. But within the discipline of synthetic organic chemistry, by the time I was doing my first postdoc, I had matured enough to understand that when you talk about synthetic organic chemistry, one aspect is developing synthetic technologies. The other aspect is the total synthesis of natural products. And I knew at the time of going to Liverpool, I was already contemplating starting an independent research and academic career, potentially returning to Africa one day. And of course, that was the motivation and attraction to uh, the work that uh, Casey Nicholas' lab was doing. Uh, and of course, I was very, very fortunate that Casey accepted me and gave me a chance to, to join his lab. Um, so it was really just part of my own development as a synthetic organic chemist and recognized that this was a gap in my training, that I'd done methodology and to really feel that I'm well-rounded as a synthetic organic chemist, I also had to experience the total synthesis of natural products. Did you find time to do any surfing or? Um, and that, the only thing we did, by the way, was uh, what we would do, we knew that on a Saturday, KC would come in um, uh, and then leave maybe at about uh, lunchtime. And then we'll go with the Barry Sharpless group and Boga group and we go and play soccer at the UCSD campus. So that's the only social that I think we used to have is just, because you know, KC's group at the time, of course, you know, there were a lot of uh, international people from Europe and other parts of the globe. Um, so soccer, you know, the beautiful game of soccer was really a unifying thing. So, so that's mostly was my social. So I just worked uh, and then uh, played soccer when there was a chance to play soccer with my friends. What did you work on with KC? So this is a very interesting story. So when I was applying for a fellowship, so, so KC, uh, accepted me, um, but he didn't have funding to fund my position. So, so he said, if I got my own money, uh, which of course was actually advantageous because I was very fortunate to, to win a work and trust uh, a fellowship to go to Scripps, which really you know, paid very generously. Um, um, so at the time of putting in the proposal to go and work with KC, I proposed, which is what he gave me, to work on the total synthesis of Zaragozic acid. Um, at oh. the time, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, surprise, we were surprise! We were <laughs> That's right, without knowing. Yeah, but surprise, surprise, Eric! By the time I got there, they had just finished making zaragozic acid um, total synthesis. So then, you know, Casey asked me to work on um, the project on brevetoxin B analogs. This is when they had just completed the total synthesis of brevetoxin B. Uh, and then if we, we were basically put on that project. Um, uh, but actually, before that, I, I mustn't jump the gun here, before working on Brewer-Toxin B analogs, we were actually, a few of us, three of us, were put on mitotoxin. That was the, the first project that he, he wanted us to try out. And then, of course, after you know, a short while, um, he then asked us to work on you know, breve toxin B analogs, where you know you, you you change the medium ring sizes to six membered rings and develop some some chemistry there. So 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 that's another thing that I did um, uh, you know, as part of my time at, uh, at Scripps with KC. So we've got that shared experience of uh, of zaragozic acid uh, to some extent, uh, but you didn't shy away from challenges. If you then moved on to breve and that remains 
a difficult molecule today, despite the beautiful work that's been done towards a synthesis um, in the Nikola group. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the advantage at the time was that, of course, you know, the guys that really, really pioneered the original total synthesis, you know, really developed the methods that one could adapt. So I guess we probably had it easier compared to the guys that really cracked it you know, at the very beginning. So from there, you went on, you returned to, to, um, to Africa, I guess, right? And, and, and started your independent career? Yeah. So thanks, Eric. The, um, actually, when I went to Scripps, I was on this Wellcome Trust International Prize Traveling Research Fellowship. And the plan was for me to return to England after my fellowship at Scripps. Now, this is a very long story uh, that I will cut short. <laughs> but you know, everything happens for a reason. But in fact, when I was at Liverpool, I met a gentleman by the name of Graham Marchins who introduced me to James Bull, um, who was then the head of organic chemistry here at the University of Cape Town. So Jimmy and I kept in touch uh, during my time at Scripps. And I think by the end of the two years or so that I was at Scripps, I was very convinced that um, there was a calling for me uh, to come back to Africa. It's a very long story. We can talk about it uh, separately. But I think that it's not even something that I can tell you. I don't think I knew what I was doing, but clearly, clearly, you couldn't talk me out of it. So through a combination of factors and, and truly feeling a calling, um, the decision was not difficult for me to make because I think I knew exactly what I wanted. I could see it. I don't know exactly what I was getting myself into. I, I met a guy who was on sabbatical in KC's lab at the time. He was an executive from, uh, this is what is today, Sanofi. Um, and, you know, he'd been to Cape Town. He says, oh, you know, you're just going to be teaching. You know, there isn't really fantastic infrastructure for research. You know, it's, it's beautiful, but, you know, I don't think your career will, will take off. But you still couldn't talk me out of that because I saw the vision. I saw it. And I could feel it. Um, I just had to walk the journey to get to that vision. So that's when you knew you wanted to do medicinal chemistry and drug discovery. But, but you probably weren't doing that right away as, as, a, as a lecturer, I imagine, right? It took some time to evolve that position so that you could actually do research in medicinal chemistry? Absolutely, Eric. In fact, just like anybody else, you are only as good as what you've been exposed to in the sense that what you've been exposed to influences the, your research interests. So when I started my group, um, I had a project on total synthesis and I had a project on methodology. But I was confronted with two realities, which again is, I think is a big lesson to, uh, you know, that I want to share with uh, young people starting their careers, um, is I recognize two things. First of all, that the environment here in South Africa was not conducive to doing total synthesis at the level I was used to, um, which means you needed not just talent, and critical mass um, of, of postdocs and so on and so forth, which was not really, really um, the case here. But, but secondly, very difficult to justify doing that kind of work here and getting funding it from, from it from South African government funding sources. So I think that was part of the reality. Um, but the second thing I recognized was that there was really an opportunity for me to make a difference. And I, to this day, do not blame or criticize anyone who makes a decision to go somewhere where they can find an opportunity. But the thing about my continent of Africa is that if all we do is leave the continent, okay, who is going to make a difference? Who is going to provide inspiration? Who is going to demonstrate that it's possible to do something from this part of the world? Because I'm a very strong believer in the power of role modeling. And I think people often don't think it can be done because they haven't seen it being done. So part of it was just my own recognition of the reality that I could not do synthetic organic chemistry at the level and, and space and scale that I was used to at Scripps 
But secondly, that this was actually an opportunity for me to reinvent myself, that I could do both. It was a question of how far do I go with one and where does my career develop? As long as I keep an open mind. And your timing was impeccable, right? Because I think that's around the time when the uh, South African government had all sorts of initiatives in drug discovery, uh, especially focused in uh, disease areas in sub-Saharan Africa, if I remember correctly, right? Correct, Eric. In fact, in addition to exactly what you said, I mean, just the timing was just perfect. I'm just so grateful that I decided to do that. So when I informed the Wellcome Trust in London that I had decided not to return to England, that I'm going to start my career in Cape Town, and they said to me, oh, on your way from San Diego to Cape Town, come through London, come and see us, because we have just begun a new funding scheme in South Africa called CRIG, C-R-I-G, Collaborative Research Initiative Grant, where if you've identified a collaborator in the UK, then the two of you can propose an idea. See, those days, it was the end of apartheid, this racial policy that we're in South Africa. And so South Africa was the flavor of the month. <laughs> so, so when I was coming here, it was just perfect timing that I'm really grateful that I made the decision I did. Yeah, I remember being involved at the time with ITEMBA. I think we've talked about this briefly. Um, and this was a, an attempt at a drug discovery um, company, spinoff, startup in South Africa based in Johannesburg uh, with Dennis Leota. Uh, among others, uh, Steve Lay, um, and, and it was a lot of fun. There was a, there was a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. You, you could sense that uh, to build that from the very ground up um, in South Africa, and for South Africa to take the lead um, in doing so. I, I was very um, excited about Itemba, uh, as you and I spoke uh, about this um, at the time that Steve Lay and Tony Barrett uh, and Dennis Tony were coming around here. That's right and the late Julian Walsh as well from Imperial College, um, and Frank Fisher and James Bull. I happened to be in charge of space in the Department of Chemistry. So actually I gave Itemba a lab space in the Department of Chemistry. And of course, for me, it was such an important and exciting development that you guys started because precisely it was going to be good for organic chemistry in general, in particular synthetic organic chemistry. So for me, that was just a game changer. Um, but I think that you, in fact, you, Eric, and Dennis Elliott, and Steve Lay, Tony Barrett, I think were my inspiration to what I ended up doing uh, eventually in setting up um, you know, our drug discovery center, um, H3D, here at the University of Cape Town. And I got to tell you, I fell in love with South Africa. Yeah, that's a dream of mine to go to Cape Town. I mean, I've heard it's really, really quite beautiful. Uh, uh, and I've only seen Durban and um, Johannesburg. And, and I found those fascinating um, uh, cities. Um, so let's continue with this discussion, sort of a timeline um, discussion of your career. What do you consider your, your greatest accomplishments, your greatest hits as a teacher, as a mentor, as a researcher, as a discoverer? If I have to single out one, it's the founding and establishment of H3D, the University of Cape Town, Drug Discovery and Development Center 11 years ago, something that began as a simple, small vision, which I developed further when I went on sabbatical at Pfizer, to look back 10 years later to see the infrastructure that we've developed, the platforms that we've developed in chemistry, biology, and pharmacology, to look at the how the team has expanded from I had five people. Now I'm talking about between 85 and 90 people across chemistry, biology, pharmacology, and business development, finance. I am extremely grateful and extremely proud because this is not about a once-off thing, but it's about really seeding an innovative pharmaceutical industry that will be good for the discipline of synthetic organic chemistry, that we can really create an industry. In fact, I tend pharmaceuticals that you guys, you, Steve and Dennis and Tony uh, started out. Um, when it, it didn't proceed, we were very fortunate to uh, 
you know, to hire some of our talent that's now been working in, in our center. So that is one single achievement I am most proud of. And I think you only have to be down in Cape Town to see what we have created. Um, that is what I would say is my greatest achievement so far. If I could follow up on, um, you know, you mentioned the, the, the people. I, I remember visiting a meeting of the South African Chemical Society. I gave a talk there some years ago and I came back energized. Uh, you know, I was surrounded by individuals uh, that were ambitious, uh, knowledgeable and just excited about sort of getting their career and their research programs um, off the ground and making a difference. And, and so it's clear that you've captured that and, and built on that. So um, congratulations on that accomplishment. It's, it's certainly something to be proud of. What advice would you give the young, right? Um, some years after you've commenced your career, incredibly successful career, um, there are different challenges. The, the world's changed. Um, what would you say to someone that's young, that's trying to figure out whether to go into science or not? So first of all, I would say a few things. So firstly, I would say this that science is not boring, yeah. So if you don't want to be bored, science is where to go because there are always problems to try and solve. That's the first thing I would say. Secondly, I would say that life is, is a journey, so, so it's not a destination. And what's important is not how you start, but how you finish. In other words, it's about starting from somewhere, keeping an open mind, making the most of every opportunity. But because before you know it, one opportunity leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And in fact, when I look back over my last, my career since I left Zambia in 1989, I never ever imagined in my wildest dream that today I will be talking to Eric Carrera, the editor in chief of JAX. I never imagined that um, you know, I will be leading of a team of 85, 90 people across chemistry, biology, pharmacology, and working with clinicians. That shows you a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. You build brick by brick. It's dangerous to perceive success as a once-off. There's always a story behind every success, and that's a journey. So um, I got a lot I could learn from you. How do you manage to run a group that size? The lesson that I've learned in life um, is, is simply this. It's not about the individual. It's about the team. If there's one example of where team-based science, and I wish people would recognize team-based science more than recognizing individuals. So I think it's about having people that you can trust, that you can rely on, because it's not about the individual, but it's also recognizing and respecting individual gifts. And I think the mistake we make in life is that we begin to elevate one gift above another. We are so interdependent. We are so dependent on each other. So I think I try to recognize that. And, and then of course, I just feel blessed that I have people that you know, buy into the vision and we work as a team. So at some point in one's journey, you're gonna play some role um, as part of contributing to um, a team effort or doing things for common good. So it doesn't matter as long as you're contributing and you're finding your calling in life. That's the most important thing. What um, research project um, are you most excited about right now that's, that's ongoing in your lab? I realize that's a tough question given that you have such a large group, but uh, if you had to pick one or two, um, which ones would those be? It's one project whose eventual outcome is improving treatment outcomes in African patient populations. What do I mean? You look at medicines or vaccines. So if you look at the clinical development of 
vaccines or medicines. Although Africa makes up about 20%, 15 to 20% of the global population, when it comes to clinical trials, less than 2% of those trials happen in Africa, which means the volunteers in phase one, phase two, phase three are from, uh, from the global north, which means by implication, the clinical trials, the dosages, the dosing regimens are optimized on those populations. And then five to 10 years later, those therapies are brought to Africa, which of course means that the African perspective is not factored in it's through no fault of anyone. It's just a number of contributing factors. So when I talk about African perspectives, for example, intrinsic factors like genetics and physiology, et cetera, et cetera. So this project, uh, we're calling it the African Drug Metabolism and Disposition Project, which is preclinically aimed at developing tools that will allow the prioritization of small molecules during their lead optimization based upon their predicted pharmacological profile in African patients. This is one of the key missions of your uh, Drug Discovery Center, of which you're the founder and director, right? Um, African-specific um, therapies um, and understanding of, of drug discovery and development, I believe. Isn't that right? That, that is correct. Um, because obviously, you know, there's a very strong relationship or link between, for example, and remember this, Africa is the most genetically diverse continent on planet Earth. And we know that there is a link between, for example, the genetics of a population or, or individual, their social and physical environment in which they live, and effective treatment outcomes. So bringing the research close to where the patient is and understanding what is on the ground is really critical to coming up with therapies that are appropriate for the African context, like in this case. Absolutely. Isn't this also an issue with respect to gender, right? That the drugs are generally, have been, I guess, catered towards male um, patients and, and then encounter all sorts of problems um, when they're administered to females. Isn't that an issue as well? Absolutely, Eric. There is actually inequality at many levels. You can talk about pediatric, you can talk about various patient populations, including women or pregnant women, uh, children under the age of five, infants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Absolutely. So the question is: somebody has to address some unmet medical need focused on a particular issue, because there are too many problems to try and solve. So I think it's a question of where is, what is your priority as you, are, you feel led to that? So for me, it's contributing in a very small way to this population, which I think could also provide a model for other nationalities, for example, in South America, for those guys to do the same thing as well, because we are just so different. So yes, so women is another patient population. Um, age, you name it, social, economic background, different patient populations requiring different models. But somebody has to champion an area that is of course of interest to them. I'm guessing you're a fantastic educators and the students uh, are lucky to have you as a lecturer. So let me ask a question about education. Um, if you were given the chance to redo the curriculum um, in science or in chemistry in particular, can you identify a few things that you would change or add or include or, or emphasize further uh, in the way we teach science and in particular chemistry? Eric, just one thing, entrepreneurship. I say entrepreneurship simply for the following reasons. 
the challenge today that we have in science, whether in Europe or the US or Africa, more so in Africa, how do we make science attractive? Are we attracting the best talent? You asked me about my background in Zambia. If you, if you think about an African or whoever, people can speak for themselves, but I'm saying, talking about where I come from. Obviously, the priority is to get a job that pays you the fattest salary you can find so you can support your family, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, because of where people come from, that's what they do. Therefore, from that perspective, a kid in a ghetto, a kid in a township, why should they study science? Because I was growing up under those conditions. There was no fascination. My issue was getting out of poverty. And I saw education as a way out of poverty. So I think entrepreneurship needs to be taught precisely because there are many competing priorities. There are many things that are important in life. Eric, when you come to Cape Town, you will land at Cape Town International Airport. You look in front of you, beautiful, amazing, incredible landscape. As you leave the airport to approach Table Mountain, which is where I am right now, I am sitting in my office just below Table Mountain. You're gonna see the slums and the poverty on your way to beautiful Table Mountain. So why should the government, whether it's in the US or prioritize science over other issues? So we have a responsibility to demonstrate that science starting from fundamental basic science research can lead to translational aspects, not only to attract talent to science, but to retain it because people can see a career in science. That's why to me, entrepreneurship is very, very important. We, we need to talk more. You need to come over here. <laughs> Um, because I think we have a lot that we could say to each other. We certainly have a lot of overlap in our life experiences um, as synthetic chemists. Uh, thank you for taking time out to uh, bring your story, to share your story and your successes um, with the global community. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure um, speaking with you. I wish we had uh, 10 hours together. Appreciate the opportunity.